you everyone for joining a special presentation of Minnesota's Changing Workforce, sponsored by Conic. I'm Jen Fitzke, recruiting lead and host of the Conic Blueprint podcast, along with our president, Tom Gettle. Where have all the candidates gone? We're excited to have someone very well qualified to answer this critical question with us here today, Megan Dayton, senior demographer with the state of Minnesota. Megan is a very engaging presenter and will offer strong insights to help us understand the changing Minnesota workforce so you can strategize your recruiting efforts. Since 2012, she has prepared demographic projections for the state of Minnesota's 13 economic development regions and 87 counties. In this role, Megan is our state representative to the Federal State Cooperative Program for Population Projections, the FSCPP, with the U.S. Census Bureau. She has hands-on knowledge of social and economic realities and recent demographic shifts. Her work engages an attentive approach to relating current demographic trends with the resulting likelihoods. Megan holds a master's degree in applied demography from the Center for Demography and Population Health at Florida State University. Please welcome our special guest to today's webinar, Megan Dayton. Hey, thanks, Jen. Um, can you tell that our communications department wrote that biography? <laughs> I don't know that a lot of people can make sense uh, uh, out of it. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you thanks for being for here. Being here. Yeah. All right. So, um, Jen, you, you gave a little bit of a background, but in more plain language, my job basically focuses on taking in data related to births and deaths from the Department of Health, uh, some migration data from the Census Bureau, putting those all together and looking at the trends that are happening right now and moving those out into the future to see what could Minnesota look like if those trends were to stay constant. Right, it's it's uh, it's an interesting field because I'm always going to be wrong <laughs> about the future, but that's not the point of a demographic projection, right? A demographic projection is not necessarily a forecast that attempts to be right. It just shows what could happen if all of these things that are currently happening remain constant. So it is so interesting and so fun to travel around the state of Minnesota and talk to people about what's happening currently here. Um, I'll get into this a little bit, but I am not from Minnesota. I did not grow up in Minnesota. I grew up in Michigan, actually. Um, and I think that is, that's relevant as I'm talking about demographic trends to people in Minnesota and around the country, truly. Um, because between the 2000 and the 2010 census, Michigan was the only state in the country that lost population. We declined in population. And so I think that my introduction to demography began actually a lot earlier in my life than I realized as I was watching people, I was watching, you know, demographic change happen in real time as people were leaving the state. Um, and then I became one of those people. I went to grad school in Florida. <laughs> um, I did my internship in Oregon, and then I ended up here working for our state demographer, Susan Brower, um, in 2012. So I became one of those people that left Michigan. My dad always would tell me that the last one out should turn off the lights. <laughs> yeah. um, so the state has, uh, uh, in, in uh, more optimistic news, the state of Michigan has begun growing again, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But um, it is, you know, I've, I Minnesota's a hard place to break into. There's a lot of in-groups, and um, they're not necessarily willing to open up to people that are not from Minnesota. So I think that my job is um, particularly interesting, looking so, so deeply and intimately at the population here in Minnesota from somewhat of an insider's <laughs> Right, I think at this point, okay, I have dogs too. This is the fun <laughs> part about the pandemic, right? Okay. Is, is the real Your life. life. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so at this point, you know, I have uh, birthed two Minnesotans and married one, right? So I think at this point I can demographically speaking retire. Um, at least that's what they told me in grad school since I've replaced myself and my husband at this point. But I, I really love living here. I love talking about trends in Minnesota. It is, it is undeniably a wonderful place to live. And a lot of the demographic trends that we'll talk about today highlight just how great of a state this is, right? We have the highest rate of civic participation of any other state in the country. It is a wonderful state to live in. We have really high labor force participation, among the highest, actually. Um, but what we'll dig into as we talk about population trends, trends in aging, trends in the workforce, is that it's a great place to live for a particular segment of the population, which is white non-Hispanic, 
right? As you dig down into some broad racial categories that we get from the decennial census and from the American Community Survey, uh, from enrollment data even, um, we start to see that it's not such a great place to live uh, for people who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, right? In fact, we have the largest gaps uh, um, by race for um, educational attainment, for economic security, a lot of those things. So I, my job, as I see it, is to shed light on those things so that we can do better. Um, because it's not that we're the worst in some of those things, it's that we have the most room for improvement. Um, and I hope that that is what my work is the foundation um, for. So that's enough about me. Let's get started. I like to begin these talks with the recent trends from the decennial census. Um, Thinking about you know my my tenure in grad school, I really never thought that demography was going to be front and center on the New York Times. I never thought that the decennial census could be as politicized as it was over the last ten years. But here we are, right? Um, and I think that that's relevant as we talk about these population shifts. So let's dig into that a little bit. So Minnesota, um, Minnesota's here growing at about seven point six percent. You can see that the green states are growing and the more Manila colored um, uh, states are seeing population loss. So we, this time around, we have three states and Puerto Rico that have lost population between 2010 and 2020. Uh, you can see pretty strong decline in West Virginia at 3.2%, Mississippi is 0.2%. And then interestingly, that 0.1% per, decline in Illinois, it looks like a very um, slow rate of decline uh, but because the size of the population in Illinois is already so large, that amounts to about 150,000 people they lost over the last 10 years. Um, so that is, that's fascinating to me. You can see Puerto Rico decline by almost 12%. That's huge, but it's more related to um, natural disaster that's happened in Puerto Rico and the lack of federal response, federal, um, federal response in Puerto Rico. Um, so Michigan is 2% now, uh, they're growing over there too, but uh, Minnesota is growing just a touch faster than the national average. We're at 7.6% and the national average is 7.4%. So if you look around at other states in the Midwest, right, and the Northeast, we're actually growing faster than almost all of them with the exception of the Dakotas related to the um, continued uh, oil industry. Um, in the in the back in oil shelf in the Dakotas there. Um, but Minnesota is growing faster than every other state besides the Dakotas in the in the Northeast and the Midwest. So you can see that there's this shift uh, in population to the south, to the southern states and to the western states. So I wanted this is the 2020 census, right? I want to take you back a little bit to the 1950s. In the 50s, Minnesota still had nine congressional seats, right? And that's what that's the purpose of the decennial census is to apportion um, the, the political representation in our country among those seats in Congress, right? So we had nine of those seats in the 1950s. As a result of the 1960 census, we lost that ninth congressional seat and we went down to eight. We've had eight ever since, right? We thought in 2010 that we would lose that eighth congressional seat and go down to seven, but we ended up holding onto that seat by about seven or 8,000 people. Now we were at about 5.4 million at that time. Uh, seven, 8,000 people is a very slim margin to, to hold on to that very last seat in Congress. So fast forward 10 years to 2020, we're again thinking that we're probably going to lose that eighth congressional seat. So we were doing everything that we could in our demography office um, to partner with community um, action groups, uh, particularly in the metro, but statewide, uh, just to talk to as many people as we could because of that highly politicized nature um, of the census uh, in 2020. So we again received the very last seat in Congress based on the 2020 census, but this time we held onto that seat by about 85 people. 85 people, right? That is the size of an apartment building. Um, that, that margin is so, so small, it's not even a fraction that's worth reporting because it would take me, you know, 30 seconds to write out all the zeros. Um, it is a very small margin. It's not something that I ever thought was possible. Obviously, you know, one person is possible. Um, but political representation based on 85 people, um, I don't know if that feels right to me 
uh, anymore. That feels that feels a little strange. So that gets me thinking about the shift that we're seeing uh, to the southern states, to some western states, for the political representation that the decennial census divides up. Right. One of the problems that we were having with the 2020 census in getting people counted in the right place one time and only one time, right, was that people move around a lot more than they did in 1790 when this was developed. My folks, for example, split their time between the Midwest and uh, the South, right? But they're only counted in one place. So despite the fact that they split their time evenly, six months in one, six months in the other, because they were down South on April 1st, that's where they're counted. That's where their tax scholars go. That's where their political representation is. You can't split political representation based on the model that we currently have. So some of this shift down south and out west in political representation has to be somewhat artificial, right? I, we don't know what the level of that is yet, um, but it strikes me that this thing that we developed in the 1790s um, might not be serving us as well anymore. Uh, as it did back then. It is still the best that we have, but I like to uh, talk about the things that we're learning um, in, in the hopes that our federal government becomes more responsive um, uh, to the changes that we're seeing. So we do have um, in this first round of data that we have seen from the decennial census in 2020, we have very broad race categories and you see those in front of you here. You can see the growth from 2010 to 2020. Remember that 7.6% that we grew by, that amounts to about 400,000 people that we grew by over the last 10 years. It's really healthy growth, right? But there's a big difference here on this chart than we've ever seen before, and that's the white non-Hispanic growth, uh, or not growth, right, decline. We declined for the very first time in our state's history. Um, the, the white non-Hispanic population declined by 51,000 people. Um, and so, because the, all the rest of those numbers are positive, we can now say very firmly what we've been saying as demographers for the last 10 years, that all of our growth has come from people who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, right? You look at the rest of those, they're all positive. The Black or African American alone cat broad race category is still the second largest cultural group in Minnesota. It always has been. Um, but I look down at the bottom here where I see two or more races. Sometimes we call this the multiracial category. But that category had exponential growth over the last uh, 10 years and now sits at 236,000. So if you rem if you think about the process um, of these of these groups of people, you couldn't always identify as multiracial. You couldn't always identify as Hispanic. These are relatively new categories that people are able to um, identify with uh, on this on this official government form. Um, so there was some conversation over the last ten years to add the Middle Eastern or North African category, uh, frequently called MENA. Right. The Department of Justice at the federal level abandoned that initiative uh, and it was not added to the 2020 form. So, right, when you couldn't, I'll, I'll highlight this later, but perhaps some of this exponential growth for two or more races or the other race category, which also had uh, beyond exponential growth, I don't even know if you can have beyond exponential growth, but really uh, strong growth in these two categories, right? Perhaps this is uh, people. Uh, shifting to this as the next best uh, way that they could self-identify, right? What these Middle Eastern or North African people are left with. So if you are uh, Iranian or Saudi Arabian or even Somali or Ethiopian, what you're left with is the Caucasian category. Now, I, I personally don't identify with any of those um, ancestries or ethnicities, right? But that doesn't feel right to me. Um, so perhaps if I did identify, um, I might choose other race or two or more races. So again, perhaps what we're seeing here is this artificial uh, shift or change in the broad race categories in Minnesota. This is still somewhat TBD. This is all the data that we have right now. We don't have more, um, um, more granular data. Uh, at the at the for the broad race categories anyway, we can look beyond the 2020 census and look at the American Community Survey. Uh, but just based on the 2020 census, this is really all we can see right now. Hey, so, yeah, 
if I could, I'll just jump in quick. Thank you. This is fascinating information. I have, I could go down questions on, on that section, but um, just a reminder to the audience members, those viewing in, uh, we'll have time at the end of the presentation for a, a Q&A session. So feel free to drop your questions anytime in the chat as you're thinking of the questions, we'll yeah. save them and then uh, ask Megan uh, in about maybe 20 minutes or so, uh, 25 minutes, and then uh, we'll, there'll be uh, plenty of time to go through those as well. So just uh, wanted to put that reminder up there. Awesome, thanks. And uh, Jen, Tom, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you wanna be more conversational about what I'm presenting here, that'd be great. Um, so just to kind of um, highlight what I was talking about before, Minnesota is still overwhelmingly white, non-Hispanic. About 76% of our population identifies with that broad race category. Um, but you can see, right, BIPOC populations grew by 454,000. So that is more than the 50 or than the 400,000 that we grew by overall as a state, um, which represents the decline by a about 51,000 people in the white non-Hispanic category. So let's talk about just general population growth in Minnesota, right? This is the uh, 87 counties in our state. The blue counties represent growth and the orange or manila colored counties represent decline. You can see all of the growth, um, uh, all of the declining counties anyway, are somewhere in the greater Minnesota area. The seven counties, the seven uh, Twin Cities metro counties have all grown and somewhat rapidly over the last 10 years. What else, what else is interesting here, right, is that those blue counties really follow that 94 corridor up through uh, St. Cloud, Alexandria, and right over to Fargo-Moorhead metropolitan statistical area over there. Um, there is large pockets of growth still down south of the cities in Mankato to the, to the south and west uh, of the Twin Cities. Um, and then Olmstead County, which is the Mayo Clinics and Hospitals, the Destination Medical Center that's there that drives a lot of population growth, really high income population growth as well. Um, I want to draw your attention to the southwest corner of the state, right? There's that one blue county that's sort of an outlier with all of the orange that is surrounding it um, in, the, in the very flat uh, farmland that is west, southwestern Minnesota. That's Nobles County. Right? It's really driven by the agricultural industry. About 25% of the population of Nobles County uh, is Mexican born, actually. Uh, so foreign born population in Nobles County. It is a very young population because of that, but it continues to grow uh, because, uh, because, it's, um, um, because of the sending country of, of Mexico. A lot of people uh, are still coming to Nobles County. So really strong growth in the counties that are listed on top here. Carver at about 17.5%. That's really strong growth. But then you can see the losses uh, in greater Minnesota um, are very modest or minimal for most counties. Tw uh, 1,250 people is the most that any county in Minnesota declined by, which seems like not a lot of people if we're talking about 5.7 million. Again, I started this presentation by talking about how seven or 8,000 people on the scale of 5.7 million is not a lot. But for Kuchichin County, the population is already so small that losing those 1,200 people is almost 10% of their total population. So the losses feel really urgent and strong in, greater, in those greater Minnesotas that are losing people. Megan, can we go back? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Jen. Jen, go ahead. I, I should know this. I think I know the answer to this, but in the Arrowhead, what's driving the population growth up there? Yeah, so we don't have any data that says why people are moving, where they're moving. So we can just hypothesize. Oh, got it. Um, and it's over these 10 years, right? So this was mostly pre-pandemic. This is not going to be any workforce changes that have occurred since the pandemic, sure. um, but likely uh, cabin country type things. This is, again, where people are being um, uh, counted, right, on April 1st. Perhaps they were at their cabin in the Arrowhead, uh, but a lot of this is cabin country, and so uh, second homes, or maybe folks have decided to make it their primary home. But those populations, again, are already so small um, that, that sure. it's a large percentage growth, but that could amount to, you know, 100, 200 people. Sure, okay. Yeah. Awesome. And then we did have a quick question from the chat. Steve asked, um, can these slides be shared later? Uh, yeah. and we'll, we'll send that out uh, through an email to all the RSVPs today. So you'll have those slides handy. Yeah, absolutely. And this is all public data. So feel free to, we would love to be cited, obviously, but uh, feel free to uh, use and share as you feel appropriate. 
I'm just looking at the chat now. I see yay, Susan, and yay, dogs. So I, I agree <laughs> on both of those. <laughs> Okay, so again, this is just uh, really to highlight that the um, population in Minnesota is still highly concentrated in the seven county metro. You can see Hennepin County is that huge dot there at 130,000 people. In fact, the seven county metro accounted for almost 80% of the state's population growth um, over the last 10 years. I don't know of any other state where the population is that concentrated in just one metro area. Usually there's a couple, even New York is split between a couple of different metro areas. Um, and here in Minnesota, we are very highly concentrated in the Twin Cities metro. So we are even more concentrated than just the Twin Cities metro. You can see this is the fastest, uh, the 20 fastest growing cities across the state and Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, are at the top of the list. Obviously, they already have the largest population. So uh, so this is just population added. Um, but when we look at percentages, almost 20% of the state's growth uh, came from those two cities alone. Um, so so that's, that's incredible, right? And then you look at the list, we see Rochester's in third place, and we see a couple of other, like Otsego and Moorhead. Um, but most of these cities that are on here are somewhere in the metro. Um, so this just further highlights that the growth is, is really concentrated. Um, so let's talk about the trends in aging. Um, this has been the, the focus of demography for, well, I don't know, since they started in the 70s. Truly, demographers' offices across the country were formed uh, in large part in the 70s. And it was in response to the birth, well, the end of the birth of the baby boom generation, right? That, that generation was born 1946 after World War II uh, to 1964, so almost 20 years. Um, and then demographers around the country were saying, well, it was a relatively new field, right? But people uh, that were focused on population trends around the country were saying, what are we gonna do with this giant population of people? We should probably start studying this. And so since then, we have been kind of uh, yelling as loudly as we could that we've got to start preparing for this huge generation of people. I would argue that we're still not prepared for this large generation of people, right? But I wanna highlight this change in the baby boom generation. So these folks, I'll look at a timeline here in the next couple of slides, but um, these folks are starting to retire. We're about halfway through the wave of retirees uh, in Minnesota, around the country, the uh, globe. So over the last uh, six decades, the number of older adults in the thousands has been pretty stable between 70 or 80,000 new retirees to the state of Minnesota, right? These are not, uh, this is not a wave of retirees coming here for our lovely weather uh, and our tax brackets here in Minnesota, right? This is a function of the, of the calendar uh, that says you have to get one year older every 12 months. I thought maybe this would be a perk of the job that I could avoid that, but I have not been able to do so yet. So it is, uh, these things move at a glacial pace, right? We can see this trend coming um, for decades. So in the decade that we just left and the decade that we're currently in, we will add the same number of retirees that we've add, added over the last four decades combined. This is something that we have never seen before and as far as the data goes, I'm not thinking that we will ever see again in my lifetime uh, based on birth uh, trends that we've had recently. And so, you know, taking that 2020s number, that 335,000, that is equivalent to the number of people overall that Minnesota added between 2010 and 2019. Total people. And this is just retirees. That is wild. Um, and it looks like after those two decades, we go back to you know business as usual with that same number of retirees. Um, but that is somewhat artificial because what we're talking about here is 65 plus. If we shifted that to 80 plus, we would just move this down two decades, uh, right? But we'd be looking at the same sort of incredible trend, um, unprecedented trend, right? So here is, uh, oh, it's not moving. Anyway, this is supposed to move. It's just, this is a population pyramid that demographers typically use um, to show how many men, how many women are in the population over time. So at the bottom, we've got our babies, our zero year olds, and every line going up to the top is one single year of age, 
to our oldest Minnesotans, 85 plus at the top. We've got women on your left, men on your right. So this is supposed to move. I have individual years of data that go through 2019, and you'll see on the slides if you if you download these on your own. But for the purposes of our conversation, this is completely sufficient. So at the top, we've got the boomers there in orange. Those are, again, folks born 1946 to 64. They're entering into higher mortality ages, so it doesn't look that much larger than Gen X. But given that they are in higher mortality age groups, you can think of just how big this generation of people was uh, when they were um, you know, pre-retirement, right? So we have, uh, what, I, what I really wanna focus on here is the dissimilarity in the size of the generations here. So after the boomers, you've got Gen X in blue. Those are folks born from 1965 to about 1981. So the boomers were so much larger than Gen X that we frequently called Gen X the echo, the boomer echo, right? There were so much, so fewer uh, Gen X. And then millennials after that is 1982 to about 1996. It is the generation that I begrudgingly belong to, um, but there I am represented in the data, right? Um, and we start to um, turn into somewhat of a barrel after that, there is a lot of similarity between the millennial generation and what comes after, which is typically called Gen Z, right? So if you think about the boomers uh, in the 60s and the 70s entering primary school, we had to uh, modify our educational infrastructure to accommodate this giant generation of people. When they entered the workforce, we had to we had to accommodate this large group of, of workers entering the workforce. And we've been benefiting from the boomer generation being in the workforce for that long because they've been paying into the public expenditures that the people on the other end of the spectrum, the retirees and the children rely on. Right. But these folks are starting to move into retirement. And again, we are having to modify uh, some of the things that we have typically relied on to accommodate this large wave of retirees. So if you think back to when I was talking about 65 versus 80, it's the same sort of conversation. We're going to switch to talking about um, healthcare, you know, where these folks can, can receive the care that they need. Um, so, so the impact is not just that the boomer generation was huge. It was, it is, right? but it is the, the dissimilarity of the, of the generation. So we have to accommodate on the front end and accommodate on the back end. Um, and so the, the stability between generations is something that will be very welcomed by demographers and public planners <laughs> around the world. So here's a timeline. This doesn't seem to be um, showing up or, or transferring over, but when you see the slides, you'll see the, the ages on the bottom. So this shows uh, 2011 here on the left end of things where the uh, oldest boomer turned 65, right? And then um, just here along the way, the oldest or the youngest boomer will turn 65. So we are truly right in the middle of this shift to an older Minnesota. Okay, let's talk about diversity too as it relates to the workforce, right? This is, um, this is back to decennial census and American community survey data that we have from 1960 to 2019. Looking back at 1960, the people in our state who identified as not white or um, uh, not white and not Hispanic, right? Uh, totaled just over six, uh, 50, 60,000 people. And the only categories that one could identify other than white were black, American Indian, and Asian. So we have seen really rapid growth in all of these populations since about 1990. But I want to draw your attention to 1980 specifically in that sort of dark green color. In 1980, that was the first time that a respondent to the decennial census could identify as Hispanic, right? Um, the same thing in 2000. That was the first time that somebody could identify as other race. And so we know these people didn't just come out of nowhere. They didn't just appear in the state of Minnesota, right? They had been here, but this was just the first time that they could self-identify in a way that was more 
reflective of how they would actually choose to self-identify. It's a function of the Census Bureau being about 20 years behind the way people would choose to self-identify. So these populations of people have to come from somewhere. And typically what we've seen is they come from the Caucasian or the white non-Hispanic category and move into the category that, that is more reflective of themselves. So it looks like this artificial decline potentially uh, in the white category um, for this initial um, enumeration of about 40,000 Hispanic folks and about 75,000 other race category people in 2000. Um, so again, this just shows that the Black or African American race category is still the second largest cultural group at about uh, 363,000 people. Um, very quickly thereafter in second place is the Hispanic race category. Uh, there is a very strong um, Asian uh, um, population in Minnesota, and then the other race category comes thereafter. The American Indian population is very stable in Minnesota since about 1990, um, just around 50,000 people. So I like to talk about the foreign-born population when we're talking about diversity too. These people are not always black, indigenous, uh, black or people of color, right? But they do contribute to the diversity in our state. So we've got about 100 years of data before you hear. In 1920, we had uh, about 490,000 people that were not born in this country. Uh, more closer to today, in 2019, the number is very similar, right? 472,000 people. Uh, in the middle, you see the nadir, uh, the, the very low point of foreign-born folks in 1970, 1980, at just 100,000. So big differences here. But the main change from 1920 to 2020 is that 100 years ago, one in four people were foreign born in Minnesota, but today it's fewer than 10%. So really big changes there. So we can see where these folks are coming from too, right? What region of the globe back in 1950, over 90% of people that were foreign born came from somewhere in Europe, right? So they were um, primarily Caucasian, they were primarily white and non-Hispanic, if they could have identified that way in 1950. We've seen really strong growth from all of those regions until more recently, right? We have uh, very large populations now of Asian-born, Latin American-born, um, and even African-born uh, folks in Minnesota. Okay, this didn't translate either. So um, this would typically have the country, the sending country, um, but but I can uh, work through it verbally here. And then if folks have questions, feel free to contact me when you actually see the country of origin. Um, but I've done this so many times that I could probably do it in my sleep at this point. Um, so this is again, a, a little bit more, but about a hundred years of data. So back in the 1900s, at the turn of the century, we had three primary sending countries. They were Germany, Norway, and Sweden. Those are the three, the blue, the purple, and the green lines that you see there, right? That was the 490,000 people, foreign-born people in Minnesota back in 1920 that you saw two slides previous. So they were white people. They were Scandinavian people, and that was the foreign-born population in Minnesota. So thereafter is what I like to call the Scandinavian ski jump because that's what it looks like to me. But remember that nadir that you saw in 1970, 1980, an absolute bottoming out of the foreign-born population in Minnesota. What happened thereafter is, an, it is a real explosion in the number of sending countries in Minnesota. So we now have many more dominant sending countries in Minnesota than we had 100 years ago, but about the same number of people overall. That very large blue line at the top more recently is Mexico. So the most foreign-born folks that we have in Minnesota come from Mexico, and it's about 60,000 people. Uh, we have Somalia is the light green line that ju has just jumped over into second place, right? And then the light blue line there is the um, Laotian or Hmong population. Um, we still have Germany at the top of the list, though, too. You see that uh, purple line there um, towards the bottom. So here's another population pyramid. This time it's five-year cohorts, but we still have our babies on the bottom. This is zero to four-year-olds, right? Um, each line that goes uh, up is five years of age. So we still have our oldest Minnesotans, 85 plus on the top. 
the green or the um, the blue portion of the bar is Minnesotans who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and then the green portion is the remainder, so white, non-Hispanic. Our oldest Minnesotans, you can see, only five percent of those folks identify as Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, and the the blue portion of the line gets bigger and bigger uh, every step you take down with the exception of uh, 20 to 24 because of educational opportunities and other things that draw people away from Minnesota, right? Um, but at the bottom, 32%, one in three babies born today in the state of Minnesota is born to a mother who identifies as black indigenous or a person of color. So we know that this blue portion of the bar is gonna continue to get bigger and bigger every year. We know that the child population will get more and more diverse every year because the parent population is getting more and more diverse every year. Uh, so there is this momentum to diversity that's already baked into our age structure. We'll talk about trends in uh, international and domestic migration here in a couple of slides, but no matter what we do at our borders, we know that our state will continue to get more and more diverse um, every year just because of the way that our age structure currently looks. So um, as it relates to the age, uh, to the workforce, right, we've got these three primary uh, age groups. We have um, children under age 18 that are mostly in school still. That is the blue, the dark blue line in front of you. We have the working age adult population. So 18 to 64, that's the red line on top. Uh, and then the retiree population, uh, age 65 is green. What this shows us is what we call as demographers the dependency ratio. We've got the working age population that are paying into public expenditures and the dependence on either side for K-12 education or healthcare related things on, the, on either ends. Um, those are the recipients of those public expenditures that our workers are paying into, right? So we have had very large number of workers from 1960 to about 2010. It started to level off, I'll highlight that in a couple more slides here, but over this next 10 years, 2020 to 2030, we actually expect the working age population to decline, right? That has never happened before in Minnesota. That is monumental. Um, still a lot of people though, right? And it outnumbers um, our children and our retirees by far. Our child population is really stable at about 1.3 million people. We're not seeing a lot of growth. We're not seeing any decline. That's just pretty stable over time. That may change, though, uh, as uh, the fertility rate continues to, um, to decline in Minnesota. But I want to draw your attention to the green line here, 2010 to 2030 specifically. Really rapid growth in the retiree population over those three decades. Um, and in 2040, actually, we have another monumental demographic event for the state of Minnesota. Um, just shortly after 2040, it looks like to us, it will be the first time ever for Minnesota where we have more retirees than children for the first time, right? So children have always outnumbered retirees. We could always spend more on K-12 education, um, but we are going to either have to shift uh, some of those resources away from children uh, into um, healthcare related settings, right? Or um, rethink what those look like. Oops, there we go. So that relates to me with, with enrollment trends as the, um, as the uh, large groups of people are doing these, these huge shifts that we've never seen before. So these data are from the American Community Survey uh, and they relate to just broad enrollment. We don't get a lot of data on enrollment from the decennial census or from the Census Bureau, right? But this is college enrollment by undergraduate or graduate degree. So our number of 18 to 24 year olds has declined over the 10 years from 2011 to 2020. Not much, I mean, you know, 10,000 people, that's not much of a decline, but it is still a decline, which is um, rare for us. Um, but our undergraduate enrollment for 18 to 24 year olds uh, has declined 10 entire percentage points. That's a lot, graduate school's up 1%. Um, but um, yeah, the number is actually down, right? Uh, but that five or 10 entire percentage points, that's a really big decline. So I wanted to look at that a little bit more. So here are data from the Office of Higher Ed in Minnesota. This is really small. I apologize if you have to get really 
um, close to your screen. I'll do it with you so you can see. Um, but these data come from the Office of Higher Ed, right? And this is enrollment for all student types. This blue line is shocking. This is undergraduate enrollment um, in post-secondary education in Minnesota. Um, we have seen really rapid decline since about 2010. It leveled off 2009 to 2010, but it really started declining after 2010. Um, and then the pandemic from 2019 to 2020 really accelerated the decline in post-secondary enrollment in Minnesota. So this is trans. This is new entering freshmen and transfer students, um, which are both declining uh, over over those that same period from 2010 to to present. Um, and we have seen the um, um, intensification, I guess, of the decline as a result of the pandemic more recently. So here's some race ethnicity data between, um, we've got 20, 2003 to about 2010, we saw really strong growth uh, in enrollment from black indigenous and, and students of color. Um, and that has been uh, eroded somewhat over the course of the pandemic. So it's been reversing the recent gains for some of these groups. And here we've got enrollment for all student types based on the kind of college. I know that two year college enrollment is very, um, uh, important for this group of folks. Um, and we are seeing that the decline in two-year colleges um, is larger than any other setting, right? And the declines that all of these um, settings are seeing, state universities, the University of Minnesota, even private colleges in the decline, um, has been um, shifted somewhat, though not entirely, over to private online schools. So very um, strong uh, um, proof to me that folks want more flexible learning environments than the traditional, uh, you know, in-person lecture setting. So when we talk about the labor force, right, we have to look at the generation of people once again. Um, so another population pyramid, this is um, death by population pyramid today. Uh, but we demographers rely on on these quite a bit. So down at the bottom, we've got 16 to 19 year olds, very uh, early entering the workforce to 80 plus on the top. Um, the blue portion is not in the workforce and the green portion is participating in the workforce. I mentioned um, in the beginning that Minnesota has very um, strong labor force participation, which is true. It's always We're always either top or tied for top with North Dakota. Um, you, you typically want to allocate about 10% um, of people not participating in the labor force for, you know, disability status or um, other life choices. Um, and Minnesota is frequently uh, right there in those primary working ages. And you can see that we bottom out uh, for not participating in the labor force um, in our 40s and really, really strong participation um, in the workforce through those primary working ages. But you can see 60 to 69, uh, folks are still participating in the labor force and then really rapid decline um, thereafter in the workforce. But some folks still hanging around in their 80s. So I wanna talk about international migration and then on the next one here, I'll go to domestic, but international first, right? This is um, the number of people moving into Minnesota from international locations on balance from Minnesotans leaving for international locations. It's usually a pretty small number of people, 20,000 is the most, um, but we are always positive. There's always more people moving here to Minnesota than leaving for international destinations. Um, in the 2000s, we were really, really strong for international immigration, right? In 2017, uh, I'll show you this on the next slide, but we were um, positive for domestic migration once again, and that led to the single largest year uh, that we have seen in 30 years um, for um, growth in our population based on migration. So we had hoped that that would remain the same, uh, but due to changes in federal immigration policy at the time, um, that number has dropped um, by about half more recently in 2019. So here's domestic migration, right? This is Minnesotans leaving the state for other states on balance with people coming to Minnesota from other states. 
Um, so I'm in here, right? I'm in. I'm here in 2012. If that, if I if I hadn't come, that would be um, one one fewer person in Minnesota. So in the 90s, we were positive every year. So we had more people moving to Minnesota than leaving for other states, which was great. We'll look at the impact on the labor force, I think, in the next slide. Um, but in the 2000s, that flipped. And so we were negative. We had more people leaving Minnesota for other states than people coming into our state. Right. Um, and that it was that way from 2002 to about 2016. In 2017, we were positive again. I don't know if you could hear us, demographers around the country. We were we were cheering very loudly, um, around the state anyway, that we were positive again. And we hoped that that would remain the same, but we have more recently in 2019 um, dropped to almost zero, about 65 people um, on balance. So the real impact here of these last two slides is on the labor force growth, right? Remember the 1990s back here when we're positive every year for domestic migration, 54,000 people added to our labor force every single year over the course of the 90s. That was, I wasn't here, right? But it must've been just wild. Um, um, and then, so more recently, 2010 to 2015, that's been cut about in half. Um, We've seen, we've started to see a wave of retirements of the baby boom generation. So about 7,000 more recently in 2015 to 2020. Um, and now here we are hopefully at, at another Nader uh, 2020 to 2025, adding about 6,000 people. This has really been mitigated by people of retirement age choosing to stick around in the labor force longer than they would have 15 or 20 years ago. Without them, we would probably be seeing labor force contraction um, at this point. So all of those numbers that you see going out into the future, that 6,000, 9,000, 13, 15,000, those are reliant on the projections that we're doing um, basically for international immigration but migration overall and so the, you know that's our real wild card we don't know what's going to happen this is just a prediction of what could happen <laughs> if things were, were to remain the same right so those numbers could change but we're hopeful that that will turn around again okay so if there is only one thing that you take away from my presentation today i hope it's this slide because for me it wraps up everything together it wraps up the pandemic age changes uh, diversity changes and the workforce. So what I've got here in front of you is Minnesota, right, on balance, and then our two main geography breakdowns in the state, which is the metro, the seven county metro in greater Minnesota. And this is the percent change in the population uh, size by those broad age groups that I talked about before. So dark blue is children under age 18. The um, green is 18 to 64, so working age adults. And then blue is 65 plus. So in greater Minnesota, that 21% growth is, uh, you know, ignore the rest of this, that 21% growth is, is incredible. We've never seen it before. We will never see it again. It is absolutely bonkers growth, right? And then you see for greater Minnesota, the blue bar, there are the dark blue bar, right? And the green bar are negative. So we're seeing children and working age adults leaving greater Minnesota. But that 21% there, right, tells me that people of retirement age have chosen to retire in place where they currently live, which is great. You should be able to do that if that's what you want to do. Um, but my job is to look at current trends and see what would happen if those stay the same, right? So if we continue to see losses in the child age population and the working age adult population in greater Minnesota, that 21%, those, those retiree folks, will not be able to retire in place because they won't have the, the, the social or economic structure to support them uh, retiring in place. So the positive thing for all of us in Minnesota, right, is that we are still um, growing for all three age groups overall, um, reliant entirely on the metro. So we know that some folks are coming to the metro. I, can, I see that this could be um, mitigated in large part by changes related to the pandemic, flexible work schedules, flexible work environments, right? You could have somebody in uh, Ely, right, who has a job um, that is headquartered in New York City or even uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, but they work and they participate um, economically and socially um, in a more rural 
community where the cost of living is lower, where um, they don't have to commute to workplaces. Um, so there is some real opportunity here um, to, to mitigate some of these changes that we've seen recently. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go over this too much, right? But this just shows um, the, the unemployed. These are data from DEED from the Job Vacancy Survey, and it shows the unemployed job seekers in the background and the, in the job vacancies in the foreground. Um, so we've seen big changes. The last, time, the last time that we had more job vacancies than unemployed job seekers was in 2001 in the second quarter. Um, that's, that switched in 2017, where we again had more job vacancies. Um, obviously, you can see the Great Recession there in the middle with a huge number of unemployed job seekers and very few vacancies. Um, the pandemic was another inflection point where we had a lot of unemployed folks and very few job vacancies comparatively. We now have an overwhelming number of job openings in Minnesota, 205,000, and that is dominated by the healthcare industry, overwhelmingly. Um, and that's happening in every state, right? That's not unique to Minnesota. So about 206,000 job openings. So currently, a job seeker in Minnesota has about two jobs available um, to them, which means people can be choosy about where they work, about what they do, about who they work for. And we've seen this reflected in, um, in more flexible work environments, in more uh, employee-driven workspaces, workplaces. So we've got the uh, working age population, and this is the projection out into the future. So this is eight, 2018 to 2038, so 2040, right? Every single region of Minnesota is seeing a decline in the working age population, with the exception of, obviously, the metro, really strong growth in the working age population. Um, but the St. Cloud region, that 7W, the black portion there that's in the middle of the state, um, and then very, very modest growth in EDR4, which is the white or kind of gray color. Um, and that is really driven by the Fargo-Moorhead MSA. Uh, so really concentrated there in the top um, and not spread out through the rest of those counties. So most places in Minnesota, if everything is to stay the same as it is right now, um, should expect to see a decline in their working age population over the next um, 20 years or so. So, and then just to really drive this home again with the labor force and current trends that we're seeing, I started my, pop my presentation out by saying all of the growth that we have experienced recently and all of the growth that we will see in the future will come from people who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, right? So we saw really strong labor force growth from the in the 90s in the 2000s. You can see that reflected here. The blue portion, again, again is the white non-Hispanic, and the green portion is Black, Indigenous, people of color. Labor force growth slowed in the 2000s, right, and has really somewhat stagnated uh, from 2010 to 2019. We saw a little bit of growth there. That's the 6,000 people every year, right, but we have declined in the portion of the labor force that identifies as white non-Hispanic. So, what that means to kind of bring it all together, all of the population growth that we have seen and will continue to see, and all of the labor force growth that we have seen and will continue to see in Minnesota has come from, right, and will come from people who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. So what that means for us here in Minnesota with these very large education opportunity economic gaps by race in Minnesota, if we don't start to mitigate some of that, it's going to impact our state overall. We're not going to be the best state to live in anymore because a larger portion of our population is uh, historically disadvantaged. So um, if you, that's a lot of data. If you don't want to look at a chart for the rest of the day, you have my permission. I can write a demographer's note if that's necessary. <laughs> Um, so I like to turn that into words for you to take away here. And there's three main ones that I want you to take away from this presentation today, which is that we will have fewer school age children compared um, relative to older adults, right? That's that shift in resources, maybe away from K-12 and into healthcare, um, if we are not to uh, shift the way that we allocate some of those things. Um, so that impacts education and training resources, right? And that directly comes back to the enrollment data that we looked at with the two-year colleges, the trades that you're all focused on here. 
the slowing labor force growth, the increasing uh, demand in the job market means that we have to rethink how we uh, retain uh, and attract workers uh, into our um, uh, into our fields, right? We need flexibility with workers. We need um, we need employee driven workplaces to continue if we want to really be the employer um, of choice for folks because they have a lot of choice, right? Uh, and then this increasing diversity uh, is is as I said baked into our age structure, right? It has its own momentum through births. So thank you so much for your for your attention, for your time uh, this morning. Um, it is it is truly my pleasure to talk about all of those things. I hope that there is something in here that helps you uh, and supports you in the work that you're doing that is uh, so important in the state of Minnesota, really in everywhere. If you have any questions, my uh, our email is there and our website has a, a bunch more data. Um, on it. And if we do still have time, Jen and Tom, I'd, ha I'd be happy to answer some questions. Yes. Thank you, Megan. That was, that was fantastic. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for the play-by-play -play comments in the, in the comments section. That's great. <laughs> thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, Jen, go ahead. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to say I took like five pages of notes. So if I did, I'm sure everybody else did, because this is coming from me from a recruiting perspective. I, just amazing to think about the implications in your last statement really resonated with me as far as what this is going to mean for our employment partners and the way that they attract, train, and retain their employees. That's so much, there's going to be more on the job training. There just needs to be, if our workforce is going in other directions with their, with their education options. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're gonna, there's going to have to be, we are, um, there's, there's pressures on the workforce, on, on workers, you know, and it's, it's kind of like the housing market where it switches from a seller's market to a buyer's market. It's kind of what's happening now in the labor force where, um, you know, my generation took on massive amounts of debt um, to, uh, to get the education that we wanted uh, to enter the fields that we wanted to be in. Um, and perhaps you know, we're seeing some of that shift where the responsibility might be more within the field to train people um, to to begin doing the work while they're getting the training that they need to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Megan, do you have um, an idea or insight behind the numbers when it comes to college enrollment, two-year and four-year enrollment? Is there data and if i miss it i apologize but is there a, a why behind that uh a why enrollment's declining correct um no we don't we don't have any reasons directly from respondents on these surveys about why uh these changes are happening um so again this is this is where we hypothesize and and um do research in the longer term right now we don't have a ton of those answers but um for me, right, we have a huge need in healthcare, which can typically be a two-year degree or a technical college in the healthcare setting. It's not doctors, right? It's not nurses, but um, in other settings in healthcare, we have a huge amounts of vacancies. With an employee-driven workforce, these folks, you know, we called them frontline heroes over the course of the pandemic, but they weren't really treated like heroes right? A lot of people left that field. And maybe some people are choosing a more flexible uh, work environment because they're able, um, able to choose that. So the training is not necessary anymore because they've gone maybe in a different direction. That's just, that's just my own yeah. um, um, very anecdotal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And then Steve asks, um, are you getting data requests from business and public sector for planning purposes. Yeah, so much. Yeah, yeah uh, probably more than ever, people are, are really focused on data-driven planning for businesses. You know, we don't have a lot of granular data anymore. It is the American Community Survey and the Census Bureau overall, it's still the best that we've got, but it's not great. You know, it's not very helpful for, for business prospects at a, at a very local level. There's huge margins of error because it's a survey. Um, but we do partner with DEED 
um, the Department of Employment and Economic Development because they collect some of their own data um, from businesses, from corporations around the state, and we can use some of that to layer um, for, for cross tabulations. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. And Kelly chimes chimes in, it's more it's like a comment. Uh, one possible reason for a decline in enrollment is a number um, of students doing PSEO and other dual credit yeah. options. We have a number of students at our community college who want to earn the two-year degree before they graduate high school with a technical degree. Yeah, right. So this is uh, kind of what I said before. This is the um, uh, a shift in education and training re resources for folks. They are getting this experience um, in high school uh, before they ever enter the labor market. So they are entering um, working age. Uh, they're, they're becoming working age adults already with these resources um, under their belt. So there's not there's less of a need to enroll. Um, I don't know how that works out with the data from the Office of Higher Ed. Perhaps those, um, because they are technically enrolled in classes at a two-year institution, perhaps those um, high school students are counted in those numbers. I really don't know, but I yeah. but but I think that that is a very valuable um, example of how we could change our mindset in training um, our future workforce. Great. Um, and then um, Steve asked, uh, is the Itasca project still a thing? I'm not sure if that's... Hmm. I don't know. I know that there's been a shift in a lot of the projects, you know, or the 2020 visions that people had before the pandemic because everything changed. But yeah. I don't know about that one specifically. And then okay. um, Bethany's question real quick with the birth rate and the fertility rate. Um, there is the fertility rate is related more to mothers, right? The birth rate is related to the babies more specifically. We can talk about the total fertility rate, which is the number of babies that the average woman will have over her lifespan. Replacement is about 2.1, right? I said in the beginning, I can retire demographically because I've had two babies. So I've replaced myself, right? That's the replacement rate. Minnesota has been below replacement level fertility for decades. Um, we're currently at about 1.6 babies for the average um, woman over her childbearing years. And that one, that point one accounts for child mortality in an industrialized country. We're down in the weeds. Bethany wants to be a demographer. I can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll connect. We'll connect the two of you. It's, that's great. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, we're overboard by about four minutes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. I really, really appreciate your time and certainly very uh, helpful for, for our audience, uh, for members of our business community. So definitely uh, appreciate you having, having um, you with us. And for everyone who tuned in today, thank you so much for joining us on, on this episode. Uh, definitely keep in touch on our LinkedIn page and uh, remember to follow the Conic Blueprint podcast. We'll have uh, some more upcoming webinars and podcasts being released soon. So keep in touch. And uh, again, thank you so, so much for your time, Megan. It's, uh, it's been uh, great information. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Megan, so much. Thank you both. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.